Welcome to the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford and WHC-TV Community Television for our candidate debate in West Hartford. This is one of two that will be held for council candidates. We are pleased to be able to bring you this nonpartisan voter service in cooperation with the campaigns and our wonderful TV station. I'm Carol Mulready, a member of the League of Women Voters, and will serve as a moderator of this debate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan but political organization which works to encourage informed and active participation in government. And we hope this debate will serve you as one piece of information that gets you ready to vote on November 7th. The debate will be conducted in a modified cumulative time format. This is designed to enable the candidates to freely elaborate <coughs> on their approaches to a variety of issues unimpeded by the strict time constraints of more traditional debate formats. Each candidate will have a total of nine minutes for response time during the debate. When speaking, each candidate has a timer for her or his own um, speaking time. And these are members of the League of Women Voters and we thank them very much for being here. Periodically, the timekeepers will hold up signs indicating the amount of time that each candidate has in remaining. Each candidate has a chance to respond to a question if they so wish. They are encouraged to rebut and respond to their differences as they perceive them, understanding that the clock is running. At the end of the debate time, each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. And the order of speaking was decided by lottery, as has been the person that gets the first question in this conversation. It is now my pleasure to introduce the candidates. Um, they were chosen through a uh, lottery, and I will read it in that order. And we thank them all for their commitment and devotion to our town of West Hartford and for giving the time and commitment that is required for this. Our first candidate is Leon Davidoff, who has resided in West Hartford since 1997. He received his BA from Clark University and his law degree from Case Western Reserve University. Leon and his wife, Lexi, have two daughters, Becky, a senior at Clark University, and Lanny, a freshman at the College of William and Mary. He currently serves as deputy mayor and was first elected to the council in 2007. He chairs the Public Service Committee. He has been a chair and member of the TPNZ. Leon is an attorney as well as the co-owner of the paper station. The Davidoffs are members of the Emanuel Synagogue. Thank you, David. Leon. I'm sorry. <laughs> Leon, I'm sorry. <laughs> there had to be a mistake somewhere. I hope that's the only one. In uh, our next candidate is Dallas Dodge. In 2016, Dallas was appointed to finish Scott Slifka's term on the town council. Dallas is a longtime volunteer coach in town, involved in youth basketball and soccer. A graduate of Conard and Yukon, he is a strong supporter of public schools. Dallas lives in the Morley neighborhood with his wife, their preschool aged son and daughter, and their Australian shepherd. Welcome. And Ryan Langan grew up in West Hartford, graduating from Conard in 1995. His parents also grew up here in Elmwood. Most of Ryan's career has been in energy efficiency and renewable energy industries, where he has worked to help improve our environment. He currently serves as the vice chairman of the West Hartford Conservation and Environmental uh, Commission. After working for General Electric in Connecticut, Texas, Ohio, California, and overseas, Ryan returned to West Hartford in 2012. He and his wife, Audrey, live in their forever home with their two dogs. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. And next is Beth Kerrigan. This is her second term that she is running for on town council. She is married and has two sons, Fernando and Carlos, who are sophomores at Hall High School. 
She has a BS in Industrial Arts and Technology from the State University of New York at Oswego. Kerrigan was a high school shop teacher and is now self-employed insurance broker for a long-term care protection and Medicare. She enjoys tennis, snowboarding, and biking. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. Chris Barnes is seeking re-election to the town council for a third term. Chris and his wife Stephanie have lived in West Hartford for 21 years and raised their three daughters here. He is an attorney with United Healthcare. Chris has coached girls youth lacrosse, served on the town's risk management advisory board, volunteered for and supported a number of local charities in town, and is currently a mentor and career pathways volunteer in the West Hartford Public School system. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Carol. Um, the, these are the candidates who are here tonight for this debate discussion. We have a message from Julie Krug, who is also running for town council, and I would like to read that now. And this is with the permission of the candidates. I apologize for not being president, present for the debate tonight. I am a risk manager for a company that sustained significant damage from Hurricane Irma and need to attend to business in Florida. As a candidate, I intend to bring my professional experience as a risk manager and community activism with local organizations to responsibly lead West Hartford in the coming years and into the future. I thank you. All right, so we will get now to the questions. And as you heard earlier, Leon Davidoff will take the first question. Um, <clears throat> West Hartford is a town that is quite developed, has a lot of infrastructure. What should be done to, to address the future infrastructure needs of this community? Uh, thank you, Carol, for the question. I'd first like to uh, thank the League of Women Voters and Channel 5 for hosting the candidate debate, which will inform our voters about all the candidates in this year's municipal election. Our infrastructure in West Hartford is uh, one where our roads are very well maintained. Uh, the council has uh, passed a complete streets policy that uh, requires any type of development moving forward to look at uh, how the development will affect uh, pedestrians, seniors, bikers, cars, just uh, anybody who's out there using, using our streets. And it's imperative that a community such as West Hartford reinvest in its infrastructure. And I think that uh, you would all agree that when you drive around town, uh, one of your first reactions is the town of West Hartford looks uh, quite beautiful in terms of uh, uh, the planting of the flowers and the cleanliness of our sidewalks and our streets and uh, how litter free we are. And uh, that's not an accident. It's, a, it's been a priority of our town to make certain that our, our infrastructure is, uh, is maintained and uh, has always been a council priority. All right. Over here, would you like to respond? You sure. To take that question? Yeah, I'd like to respond. Thank you, Carol. And also, I'd like to thank West Hartford Television and, and also the League of Women Voters for hosting the debate tonight. Um, this is going to be an easy one. I largely agree with Leon. It's the only time I'm going to say that tonight, that our town is um, beautiful when you drive around. When you're in other towns, you notice that it's not the same as being in West Hartford. Um, what I would say is the town is largely, almost fully developed. We have issues with our roads, uh, the quality uh, of our roads in terms of infrastructure, there are school maintenance issues, if you've been in our, our public schools, that you know, they're going to need uh, attention now and, and in the years to come. And our challenge is going to be being able to finance that you know, update to our infrastructure to continue to provide that high level of, of service. And I'm sure that's an issue we'll talk more about when we get to the, the budget issues. Okay. Anyone else? I'd, I'd like to just add something um, in terms of the infrastructure. Uh, what I really appreciate in West Hartford is if you happen to live on a street that's uh, traveled frequently and at a high rate of speed, the town goes so far as to uh, study that street and perhaps change the, uh, the street such to make it safer for the kids living on that street. And we live on Arnoldale and we really appreciated the town getting involved in that to make Arnoldale a slower uh, commerce street. So. 
And if I could just add, and I agree with everything that's been said, and I think that this is an area that we can agree on, I do want to emphasize the importance of maintaining and investing our infrastructure to continuing business investment in our community. That's one of the primary things that businesses look at when they're looking at a town to move to. And it's also something that property owners look at, uh, homeowners. Homeowners want to see clean streets. They want to see well-maintained infrastructure. And again, I think that's one of the reasons why West Hartford remains one of the most desirable towns in Connecticut and a place that's continuing to attract young homeowners. Um, I, I want to add one point to Mr. Dodge's statement. I, I don't think the data support the continued attraction of young homes and households to this town. In fact, that population alone, it was in the current very recently, 7% decline in households with families with kids in the last five, 10 years. People are leaving West Hartford. And I think it's because it's getting too expensive to live here. And I would say, Ryan, as I've been out meeting voters and just in my time on council, one thing that I've been struck by, and this has been recently, is how many people I've met who have actually moved to West Hartford from places like New York City, from places like Boston, because they wanted to raise a family here. I think that um, the evidence that I see, which is talking to my neighbors, which is um, meeting people at events, shows that people do want to live in West Hartford. This is a family-friendly community, and of course we need to worry about affordability. But our schools, our services remain very attractive, and young families want to move here. Um, and more importantly, they are moving away from major cities to live in a suburb like West Hartford. Most of the data doesn't reflect what you just said. Maybe the backroom barbecue conversation does, but the data doesn't. Do you want to expand any more on that, Ryan? With the uh... Well, I mean, you could look at West Hartford. You could look at what the current put out. You could look at the the you know statewide population numbers we're losing people we're losing families and it's because the whole state is too expensive to live in and to raise families in. all right I, well. I, i'd like to just say something okay. i don't think i thanked you earlier thank you carol and, and the league of women voters and all the viewers at home um i experienced the same thing as, as dallas did uh, knocking on doors um i actually uh, on sunday hit a door where the gentleman said they had just moved in yesterday which was on Saturday, and the wife was pregnant with their first child and due that same day. So um, I'm not going to argue with the data, because I'm sure it's accurate for the state overall. But for West Hartford in particular, individuals like myself and others come here because they're choosing to raise a family in a wonderful community. Since we're going to continue on this conversation, I'll add that the declining enrollment in our schools, I think, is exhibit A you know, to the data that Mr. Langan is, is discussing. Our school population has gone from about 10,500 or so students projected over the next 10 years to be somewhere around 8,500, 8,600 kids. So clearly the numbers are going down uh, in our town and that's a concern. That is a challenge for us to be able to reverse that trend uh, as best we can. And I have one anecdote as well. I actually was knocking on a door on Saturday and uh, spoke to a gentleman who moved to town from Glastonbury. Uh, about eight months ago, and he was shocked to receive his first tax bill, which was a 38% 30 increase over the time when he purchased the home, and he was concerned about where our mill rate was going uh, in light of our own budget and the state budget, and, you know, it was a significant hit. So, you know, these are very real concerns that people in town have. Let's continue on that vein with the increase in taxes. Uh, the League has discussed a question um, of this type because we knew of um, people getting their tax bills and, and conversing with us. One person said the tax bill went up 10% over the previous year. What, seriously, what can we do in our town to keep that kind of an increase I hadn't heard about 38 percent, but an increase of that magnitude from occurring again or repeatedly. Um, go ahead. Would you like to try? Sure. Yes. Um, it is true that, unfortunately, um, due to state-mandated property revaluation, some, some homeowners did see a significant increase in their tax assessment. 
The good news is that the reason for that in most cases is because West Harvard's real estate market is incredibly strong. And some places saw a significant increase in home values, and that's reflected in the increased um, assessments. But again, in the future, we need to continue working on maintaining operational efficiencies and controlling spending. That's certainly part of keeping taxes under control. Um, but we also need to continue to maintain the level of services, the quality of education that continues to attract families to West Hartford. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, you know, we've heard 10%, we've heard 38%. I'll give you some real facts. From 2007 to 2017, that's 10 years, taxes have gone up by $78 million. That's a 45% increase, right? That is making West Hartford a very unaffordable town. Um, the Hartford Current, again, ranked West Hartford 47 out of 50 at the bottom of the list with Hartford, New Britain, and East Hartford for property tax affordability. As a percentage of median income, taxes here are through the roof. And we have to do something about it. We need smarter spending in this town, or all these families who love to be here, they're going to move to Farmington. They're going to move to Simsbury. They're going to move to Glastonbury. And if I could just respond quickly, part of what's reflected, and I think one thing that we need to work on to continue increasing West Harvard's competitiveness is we do include services that other towns don't. For instance, in Glastonbury, there's no municipal trash pickup. That's a service that we continue to have in West Hartford. Um, and that is reflected in our mill rate. Another thing that West Hartford has that, and again, Glastonbury doesn't have because they're a contract member of the MDC, is Glastonbury uh, does not pay for sewage. In West Hartford, because of the way that MDC assesses towns, West Hartford is responsible for paying that sewage bill. And in a way, we actually end up subsidizing other towns, in particular Hartford. And that's why I'm very proud of the job that the Democrats have done um, advocating moving away from the ad valorem um, assessment. I think it's one area that we actually agree on. Um, in particular, I know that Chris and I have had discussions about this. And so I do agree, our, when comparing, you need to make sure that you're comparing apples and oranges, though, because when you compare us to a neighboring community, you need to look at the services that are being provided in that community. And so just using Glastonbury as an example, those are two important services that aren't reflected in their mill rate. Chris, how about you? Sure, I'd like to add uh, to that conversation. Um, Mr. Dodge mentioned that the, the real estate market is incredibly strong. I think there are people in our community that are very concerned about our real estate market and, and the value of our, um, uh, our real property. In terms of mill rate, West Hartford is, is somewhere in the top 14 towns or cities in the state of Connecticut in terms of mill rates. Our mill rate's just over 41. And over the next couple of years, we'll likely see 45, maybe even 50 uh, in terms of mill rate. And so while we do want to maintain the services as best we can, I think the question is, what can we do to reverse that trend? And what we need to do is we need to look at kind of streamlining and restructuring our, our town government to be able to afford, um, you know, the things that we enjoy uh, in our community. And the answer can't always be raising taxes and borrowing more money uh, and having ever higher budgets. We need to make the tough decisions to protect our town going forward. Thank you. Um, I think that's another thing we can all agree on. There's nobody here that enjoys paying more. Uh, when prices go up, people get upset, and rightfully so. Um, as a middle-aged uh, mom who's probably closer to retirement than, than most sitting here. I am hypersensitive to increasing costs with a income that is, is stable um, and soon to be pretty fixed. Um, so I take this very seriously. Um, but I will say that um, I spoke to a gentleman complaining about taxes and I understand I don't want taxes to go up. But the fact is, is in five years his house had gone up $100,000. I kid you not. And so if he was to look at that as a simple investment and say, wow, I've earned $100,000 in the last five years while I enjoyed living in West Hartford and enjoyed my house, then quite frankly, should he complain? I think we can all, when we come together and we review our budget item for item, talk about where we can make um, changes, and, and certainly we will do that. But um, I do think that 
from a tax standpoint, nobody likes it. We work hard to manage those taxes, but also the reason that so many people have experienced the recent tax increase is because of the assessment of the houses. And I would just add to that that there are many people in the middle price range and higher that have seen dramatic decreases in the value of their property where their tax payment in some cases is higher than their mortgage payment. So what happens when you have higher value properties being pushed down in value? That pushes the value of everybody's property down. So a buyer can buy more house, but it's you know decreasing the value of real estate across the board. And that's the risk we face, that if we continue to raise property taxes, property values are going to go down. And there's a direct correlation to those two things. So that's, that's my concern. May I add one other point? Yes. Um, you know, the tax revenue is driven by mill rate and valuations. You were just talking about valuations, Ms. Kerrigan. In that scenario, if all valuations were going up, the opportunity is there to reduce the mill rate. The fact of the matter is, is the town has not reduced the tax burden on West Hartford in quite a long time. And I, I don't know where that $78 million tax bill increase is going. Frankly, I'm scared because most of the people I talk to, they don't know where it's going either. And if there is a real serious commitment to controlling taxes, I haven't seen it in a budget for at least five or six years. Okay, so we're talking about mill rate and tightly I'd connected like to, uh, to weigh that. weigh in on this uh, topic. Okay. Um, okay, so um, to Mr. Langan's point, I guess the question I would raise is, what services and programs would you cut? And uh, I know in the 20 years I've lived in West Hartford, I've purchased my home for 131000 And according to Zillow last week, it could be sold for 260000 And I appreciate the value for the services that we receive. We have strong, excellent schools. Both of my daughters attend outstanding private universities. We're a very safe community. And we've made safe investments, sensible investments, in our community. And it's imperative that we grow our grand list with development and reinvestment. And over the last uh, 10 years, we've had a multitude of proposals that have done that, that have come forward uh, to the council and have been approved, that uh, have uh, added uh, to our tax base. And I would say that um, when I look at budgets, um, I, I think that they need to be fiscally prudent and which minimize the impact on our, on our taxpayers. And uh, I think uh, it's pretty clear that uh, we, we need to like to go to the taxpayer last uh, to fund the services and programs that we provide here in West Hartford. Okay, so uh, taking all of what you've said, talking about the mill rate, talking about services, there aren't many places to go in the judgment of some. There is a, there's an alignment between the mill rate and all the property taxes and corporate development. Um, are there opportunities here to increase or re development here or redevelopment? Can it be, can, is the town proactive or can it be proactive in looking at that commercial grand list to um, assist property owners? Well, I, I, I'd like to start in that, Carol. So if you just look in the past council term, We've had two projects that are going to positively impact our grand list. Uh, one is the reinvestment in the Sears property. Uh, the Sears store has closed and an investor has come in and they're going to build a, a Shake Shack, a Saks uh, off Fifth, REI is going to move over there. Uh, they're going to modernize that, uh, that plaza and it's not going to become an eyesore in the Corbin's Corner neighborhood. But more significantly, along the busway, you see at 616 New Park Avenue, uh, a mixed-use development of uh, residential apartments. And that used to be the old Pontiac Center property. And you're going to see uh, feet on the street. You're going to see uh, people living there. And I think as people start to see more economic development along that corridor, I think you'll see more investment. I think recently you may have read in WeHow.com about a company from the Carolinas who's moving up into that industrial park so they can be closer to their customers. And where do they pick to uh, locate their business? West Hartford, Connecticut. So um, this is an exciting place to live. This is a great town. There are more people who would like to locate their businesses in West Hartford than we have parcels available. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. 
Okay. Can I go? Any of you just go ahead. Sure. Conversation. Um, with respect to, to the grand list, our town grand list is in excess of $6 billion. And so to be able to raise additional property tax revenue from those parcels on a year to year basis is very difficult because it, it, we have a very developed town. Our former town manager, Ron Van Winkle, once said that we would need four blueback square developments every year to even come close to covering our average budget increase year to year. That's simply not going to happen and not sustainable. And so while we do see some increased revenue each year from this development, that is not going to reduce our tax burden in town. Well, to complicate things even further, <laughs> we have a state budget that uh, is not looking very healthy at the moment, and the prospect of West Hartford losing quite a bit of um, support from the state. $27 million was a number at one point, I think. So will you um, start, Beth, with talking about what impact that's going to have in West Hartford and what West Hartford's going to have to do to address this in the long term. Is it going to happen in one year or is it going to be an ongoing problem? I am going to start with hope. Um, I think that uh, most of us believe that a 20 million, 24 million, 27 shortfall is not a reality. Uh, that to ask to balance a budget with that type of shortfall is unreasonable. I think that uh, we believe that those individuals that are that we have voted in to represent us represent us in West Hartford at the Capitol are going to fight hard so we get every dollar that we have coming to us so that we are going to have to as we continue to look at our, our budget recognize that we will receive some money from the state no doubt the state is in in bad shape um, we will experience some shortfall but to our credit we have set up a contingency fund for that, and we have balanced a budget this coming year with some deficit from the state. So I think that with our eye on the, the long term, looking at what matters most, like schools, uh, public safety, um, we're going to be okay. Um, I'll go next. Um, the state government and this budget process is an absolute disgrace. Um, they, the legislature, waited six months to do anything about a budget, missed their deadline, missed their special session deadline, let the governor take the reins of the state budget, uh, which is one reason why we're facing potentially these cuts, and still have not um, agreed to a budget that the governor is prepared to sign. I think we have long-term problems in the state, and those are going to mean that we're going to have long-term problems in town. I expect in the next couple of years we will no longer see any state aid uh, to the town of West Hartford, and we better start preparing for that inevitability. With respect to the West Hartford budget, it's a very risky budget, as I said, on budget night. We would usually prepare a budget based upon the governor's proposed budget, and that's what Mr. Van Winkle did in March of this year. The budget that was passed by the Democrat majority on budget night, April 25th, was a very different budget. It took out all of the cuts that the governor proposed, every single one of them. This contingency fund that has been discussed is simply increasing our budget by $7 million and hoping that the money comes in. It's not a contingency. We are totally exposed. If our aid is eliminated, we're looking at somewhere between 24 to $26 million cut from our town that will result in higher taxes, a higher mill rate, it will result in cuts to services, and it will put at risk our credit rating because we will have to use our reserve fund to backfill um, uh, those needs. I'm surprised that more people aren't upset at our state legislators for failing to protect our public schools, which my colleagues profess to want to protect, as I do, but they are voting against our public schools and a Republican budget which proposed to flat fund West Hartford in 2017 and also not shift a portion of the teacher benefit uh, pension fund onto the town, which in and of itself would bankrupt our town. And so those two factors alone, not having a cut to public education funding and not pushing the teacher pension obligation to the towns, I think are two very strong reasons to support the budget that has been passed and encourage the governor to uh, vote for it. 
Okay. Can, can I just add to that? Um, what's interesting is that of the 169 mun municipalities, 139 were hit hard, like West Hartford. So if anyone wants to believe that, in fact, the representatives from those municipalities aren't going to come together to find a way to fund their town for the people that voted them in, isn't really looking at how the system works. So when I say hope, I'm not saying be delusional. I'm saying understand the way the numbers work. You can't hit 139 municipalities and expect to have a budget. Well, that's exactly what happened and that's exactly what we're looking at. So while those candidates or, or those uh, state officials may not like that result, they have not come up with a budget that can pass the legislature. And so we are facing a choice between the benefits that went to the state unions through the CBAC agreement, the governor's desire to fund Hartford, and take that money out of what he considers to be wealthy communities. And so we are in the crosshairs of the, the governor looking to cut our budget. And I hope that um, you know we have a budget soon. October 1st is coming up. Our first state aid formula grant is due to the town. And that is in jeopardy. And so that first 25% payment, somewhere around $5 million, will not be coming to our town on or around October 1st if we don't have a budget. Anyone else? Okay. In the midst of all this, of course, we know that Hartford is in more serious condition than um, West Hartford might be and many other communities. And uh, Lily had discussed at its meetings the, what is the responsibility of the, of the community surrounding Hartford where many of the workers live? Um, does West Hartford have any responsibility to Hartford? How would you address that? Um, Ryan, do I have to start? Um, yeah, sure, I could start. Uh, you know, I think, I think Hartford finds itself in a situation that is largely of its own doing. And to be quite frank, the bankruptcy laws were written for the exact situation in which Hartford finds itself. Uh, so no, I, I don't think that West Hartford is financially responsible for the extreme mismanagement of Hartford City finances. I think that would be an unfair burden on our residents and it would just encourage more bad behavior by other towns. On top of everything else, it's not like we're sitting on a pile of cash that we could easily throw to Hartford to bail them out. We have our own budgetary problems. So no, I, I really think Hartford has to clean up its own mess. Okay, Dallas, how about you? I agree with Ryan. I think that, um, again, as a town councilor, I was elected to represent, or not elected, but appointed to represent the citizens of West Hartford. And so my first priority is protecting our, our residents. I am concerned about sort of a domino effect, obviously, where if Hartford were to declare bankruptcy, there would undoubtedly be an impact on surrounding communities. But one thing I've been talking about lately, and Carol, you hit this on the head talking about workers living in places like West Hartford. We hear a lot about the importance of Hartford to the region as a regional hub and as a major employment center. What we don't talk enough about is the importance of the suburbs to Hartford. Because again, whenever a company looks to relocate to a place like Hartford, they're going to look at the suburbs that surround it because that's where executives and workers are typically going to live. And that's why it's important that we need to make sure we continue to protect inner ring suburbs like West Hartford because Hartford, in many ways, is reliant on our own success. Okay, anyone else? Okay. All right, that is, a, that is certainly a, a challenging question, um, dealing with the Hartford area. Also, is that we're, we're talking about so much of a challenge for every single community, given the state situation, given uh, our own towns uh, having increasing costs. What about cooperative opportunities among towns? West Hartford has the health district with Bloomfield. That's one example of a cooperation to reduce expenditures. Some people say MDC is that, but I think MDC has gotten a little bit complicated to use as a, an example of the kind of cooperation that might um, work to solve problems in budgeting. 
So can some of you come up with some ideas of cooperation with other communities that might help us to reduce costs in West Hartford? Who hasn't spoken? Leon. Uh, thank you, Carol, for the question. Um, we do um, cooperate with our surrounding towns, especially in the public safety arena. Uh, when there's a mutual aid uh, call put out, uh, we'll cover for firehouses or uh, police. And uh, we do have specialized equipment, whether it be for SWAT team or diving things. And uh, canine, uh, other communities come and help ours if, if our canine unit's out. But as an elected official to the town of West Hartford, my first responsibility is to our citizens. So before we decide that we're going to participate in these joint ventures with other communities, we have to do a thorough analysis and we have to ask tough questions. And the first question we have to ask is, is this fair to our West Hartford taxpayers? Is it something that's going to generate value to them as well as for the community that we're helping? I think. West Hartford people in, in, as a whole like to, to help their neighbor and, and we do in a lot of a uh, variety of, of ways. Uh, we support the arts in, in Hartford. Uh, we support um, uh, the, the magnet school uh, program. Uh, we, we do a lot of things uh, with our, our neighbors uh, whether they be in Newington or be in Hartford or be in Bloomfield and there are things that, that you don't see that are, that are transparent. And um, I think that there are opportunities, but before we make that decision and say, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, we really need to understand the fiscal impacts of all those things. And when I served on the Newington Council in the early 90s, there was a big issue as to whether or not we should buy one of those bucket trucks to put up holiday lights. And the criticism was, everybody's gonna to wanna to put up their holiday lights at the exact same time. So how is this bucket truck going to help us for that sole purpose. But in the end, they did purchase that uh, piece of equipment and uh, they figured out a schedule and they worked out all the details. And I think that's what it takes. It takes creative thinking, problem solving, and get all the facts together and you'll find the solutions. And that's always been my approach and that's the approach that uh, I'm willing to work with anybody I serve on the council with uh, to, to find solutions. I think that's what it's about. That's what the voters elect us to do. Um, we're given the time, let's find the solutions. Carol, I, I think your question you know, touches on regionalization, um, and it's a topic that we've been confronted with over the, the last couple years. I agree with Leon, the two biggest things that we have to consider are one, you know, whether it's in the town's best interest, and two, whether it makes financial sense. But when we talk about regionalization as a way to help Hartford or help other communities, really what we're talking about is the big drivers of our budget. So we're talking about education, we're talking about public safety, we're talking about public works. And that's the question we need to ask ourselves. I'm not advocating for one or the other, but that's the discussion we need to have. Do we want to share our public schools? Do we want to share public safety? And do we want to share our plow trucks and public service with the city of Hartford in particular? Because those are the things that are going to make a change in the city of Hartford's budget. <coughs> Okay, anyone else? I'm sure I'll, I'll add to that. Um, I, I do think we want to be cautious whenever we enter into an agreement of sharing and the MDC, as you cite, is one of those examples where unfortunately uh, we carry the, the lion's share of the burden in terms of our sewer charge based on our property values. So even though we're sharing the water of the MDC, West Hartford is not treated as an equal. Um, so it does have its downside, but on the upside, I do think there might be opportunities, say, for instance, like 911, where we could have a 911 where everyone could call into in instead of all these individual 911 centers that are, that are out there. So I, I do think we need to continue to explore, we need to continue to talk, we need to look at what else is out there, but to say yes or no to everything without really getting into the weeds would be dangerous. Okay, one of the um, significant parts of the budget every year has to do with the fiscal liabilities that come with pensions. Um, so I'd like you to address that for where we are now and where do we go from here. Who would like to start? Carol, I have 30 seconds left. Hold on, don't put that up. <laughs> so I'm not okay. sorry. Right. So you're going to hold, hold off. off? Hold off. You you're can have some of my time. What's that? I'd love to have your time. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll hold off. <laughs> okay, somebody else is going to start and he'll rebut. About the liabilities, the pension, uh, pension liabilities. liabilities yeah, how, no how is that's West a, Hartford big, doing, and what is going to have to happen in the years to come? That's a real conversation. I mean, we, we need to understand that we've made uh, contracts with individuals, we made promises, we made commitments, and we want to be able to our, uh, honor them to uh, the extent that we can, where it's financially sound. Right now. Um, I must say, my first term, my last term um, in town council, when you really get into the finances. I discovered, we all, some of individuals probably knew that, that we hadn't funded some of these um, liabilities, be it pension. Um, and this goes way back, you know, 20 years. So unfortunately, unlike the state, we are in a position where we need to look at these things and start really funding the obligations that we made. Ryan, what do you think about pensions and Yeah, you know, pensions, uh, it's a tough one. You know, I, I've got friends and family who are, you know, teachers and have been with the town uh, as employees for decades and decades and you know back in the 60s it was it was something that you had to do because you could get out of high school and work for the town in public works or you could be a construction worker and the construction worker made a lot more money uh, and so the towns had to compensate with pensions and other things and that formula probably worked for a little while it's obviously blown up in everyone's face over the last 10, 15 years. There are some towns and cities around the, the U.S. that have taken a very proactive approach to this. Uh, and a lot of private companies have already gone to all 401k uh, retirement benefits and, and no uh, defined, or no defined uh, benefit uh, pensions. Uh, and so I think we've got to tackle that big problem with some real big thinking um, but this has been simmering on the stove for a long time, and, and I wonder why it hasn't been dealt with last year, two years ago, or even six or seven years ago. Uh, Carol, I'd like to uh, give some historical context to this. Uh, almost 20 years ago, as Beth said, uh, there was no payments made to the, uh, to the pension fund, and uh, it was felt that the contribution wasn't made, and uh, what we're giving the taxpayers is a zero percent tax increase, and, and that's what happened. And that happened under both uh, Republican and Democratic uh, majorities. Since then, there's been a serious uh, concern about the pension uh, liability, and the contracts that we have negotiated have uh, addressed this issue such that we have moved our employees off of a um, defined pension thing to a 401k plan. Uh, that's most uh, recently evidenced by our new firefighter contract uh, where we made significant changes in uh, health care and in uh, pension liability. Of course there's more work to do, but uh, we're honoring our commitment and every uh, budget that I voted on in the council my tenure, we have funded our ARC, our annual required contribution, every single year. And um, it's, it's something that has always been a concern of all members of the council regardless of their party of affiliation of how are we going to solve this problem. And this problem doesn't exist in a vacuum. It also is affected by market conditions because these pension funds that are in the 401k are in uh, stocks and how's the market doing and what's the rate of return. And, and those are important concerns. So I would say that uh, when, you, when you sit down and you examine the issues and you get a handle on what the concerns, the financial concerns about the liability with respect to our pensions. I think then you can put it in the picture of our entire budget and you can put it in that framework. And I think you get a really uh, good understanding that uh, all the councils that I have served on, uh, the members have been quite committed to uh, dealing with uh, this, this issue. And I think moving forward, they'll remain uh, very committed to uh, working for solutions. Uh, to uh, our unfunded pension liability. I would like to make a, a, a point of clarification. Uh, you spoke about the, the pensions 20 years ago. Uh, those were fully funded. It was over the last 15, 20 years where those funds were not kept up. And, and that's why we're in the trouble we're in now with vastly underfunded pension liabilities and healthcare liabilities. Okay. All right. Um, let's see, we still have some time left. Um, one, one. Oh, 
I didn't say anything. <laughs> you were <Osmosis>. thinking. <laughs> oh, little, little discussion sure. about time here. Um, one, of the, one of the conversations that is happening a lot everywhere is civility. And I would like you each to talk a little bit about how does one encourage civility, particularly in town politics and through our, throughout our schools. And uh, Dallas, why don't you start? Sure. One of the things I've actually found most enjoyable since I joined the count, town council is how much I genuinely like all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and how much I've enjoyed the opportunity to work with them. I think that we have an understanding that at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, which is whatever is best for West Hartford. We may disagree sometimes on how to get there, but I think that there's a respect uh, between all of us where we do understand that. And I think one important thing is, you know, continuing just one-on-one, -on -one, even personal interaction. Um, you know, one thing I get concerned about today is the way the electronic communication can actually impact how people talk to each other because people might be willing to talk a certain way over social media or through even email uh, that they wouldn't talk to a person face to face. And so one thing that is critical to me in working with colleagues, um, also interacting with voters, is that face to face contact. Um, because I think that is something that's missing in politics today and that's one thing that I've been really working hard on uh, since I've been on council. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, number one, you know, respect for everyone is, is kind of what I think we really need to get back to civility. Openness, diversity, those are all key values that I think are the cornerstone of our West Hartford community. I don't think we see um, bipartisanship in this state, maybe even on this town council sometimes. Uh, I think that would be a huge, huge benefit to everything that's going on with the state budget, with Hartford, with things in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so, you know, I think if we all respect everyone, even on other sides of the aisle, we'll get over this civility challenge that we seem to have right now, uh, I think, in America. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Carol, I, I'd like to address that. Uh, I think uh, West Hartford, our, our government, our volunteer government, is, is quite civil. Uh, we we uh, treat each other as well as the members of the community who come before us uh, with civility and with respect, um, and I would expect nothing nothing less than that. Uh, with respect to bipartisanship, I think if one was to analyze the votes on the town council, I think 99% of the votes are 9-0 votes uh, at our meetings. And um, I think what's important to me is when you lose sight of the fact that you're here to serve the best interests of your community, then you've really uh, not done justice to the role of being a public service servant, especially an elected public servant. Okay. Beth, did you wish to? Yeah, yeah, I mean, civility. I mean, what an important topic, particularly in this political climate that, that we live in. What a, you know, to model civility for our children in particular as they go forward to learn how to talk and listen. Um, I try to live my life, you know, seek first to understand and to be understood. I think that's really important. But when I look at the civility, that begins on our streets, in our neighborhoods, it starts with not speeding down someone's street. It, it, it starts with not, um, we have block parties, annual block parties, and there's not a block party that we have where somebody decides that it's okay to go around the barrier where it says, road closed, block party, because they feel somehow that they're uh, entitled to drive down the street because they pay their taxes. So. I think we need to continually remind each other that we are sharing this time, this place, uh, this town. Um, you see it with cell phones all the time. People can be rude. So I don't know how you can be that person and then come to a table like this and expect to um, really make things happen. So I'm hoping that uh, we all continue to be better at being uh, connected human beings. Thank you, Beth. Last word, Chris. Thank you. Um, <laughs> One word. We are, I have 30 seconds. We are volunteers, and we serve the people of, of West Hartford. We all do, and, and that's uh, what we all strive to do. And while we may disagree at times uh, on some things, uh, Leon's right. We usually agree. The most important vote, though, that we make every year is on the budget. 
and the budget has been 6-3 for four years in a row. I voted no on every budget that I've considered. That is a place where it is partisan. It is a place where the town manager and the mayor make policy behind closed doors, and it is a part of a process that I think the Republicans should have a seat at the table uh, to be able to help craft ideas uh, to move our town forward. All right, thank you. Th thank you for this discussion, uh, wide-ranging, I think, uh, even th with our fiscal efforts um, being uh, and most challenging at this time. So the candidates now will have two minutes for a closing statement. Our timers will reset the clock for two minutes, and um, this w the order was done by lottery. And number one is Leon Davidoff. Oh, thank you, Carol. I'd first like to uh, thank the League of Women Voters, as well as Channel 5, as well as Chris and Ryan for participating in a very uh, lively debate here this evening. As a deputy mayor and as a town councilor, I've worked cooperatively with my Democratic colleagues to support budgets that are fiscally responsible. I will continue to support budgets that maintain services and programs such as excellent schools, fantastic recreational programs, outstanding libraries and senior centers, and high quality public safety services that make West Hartford a first rate place to live, to work, and to raise a family. I truly enjoy serving on the West Hartford Town Council, especially when we decide zoning matters. Prior to my being elected to the Town Council, I served for many years on the Planning and Zoning Commission, including three years as its chairperson. During the past two years, the Council has approved extensive development and reinvestment in our community, as evidenced by the renovations to the Sears Plaza and the new apartments on New Park Avenue. New development and reinvestment signal one thing, West Hartford's a great community to do business in. I'm a big fan of recycling, and I was thrilled when we recently announced that our blue recycling barrels would be picked up on a weekly basis. Less trash in the green barrel, and more recyclables in the blue barrels saves our ton, town lots of tax dollars. My approach to addressing the issues that face our community has always been straightforward thinking. You can count on me to advocate for well-reasoned, common-sense positions that are in the best interest of our residents in the town. West Hartford's brightest days lie ahead. As your town council, I will continue to bring a creative, professional, and well-thought-out perspective to finding solutions to the issues that our town encounters. For the past 10 years, I've been honored and privileged to serve on your town council. So on November 7th, please vote for me, Leon Davidoff, and the entire Democratic team so that I can continue to make a great town even better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leon. And next we'll have Ryan Lincoln. Oh, I thought I was number three. Okay. Uh, well, I'll make, this, uh, I'll make this short and sweet. First of all, Carol, thank you so much for moderating. Uh, thank you, West Hartford Television, and thank you, thank you, thank you, League of Women Voters, for doing all the organizing and timekeeping and everything else, and smiling at us on the other side of the camera. Uh, listen, my, my campaign, the reason I want to be a town councilman for the first time is because I love my hometown, and I'm really concerned about where the financial situation is taking us. A $78 million tax increase over the last 10 years is making our town very unaffordable. It's hurting the middle class, it's hurting retirees on fixed incomes, and in the long run, it could put the whole town at risk. I love this town and I don't wanna see that happen. My niece and nephew live in town, they go to schools here. Uh, aside from my politics, I'm, I think I'm a, a great guy uh, that <laughs> everyone here would agree with. Um, I'm a very nice guy um, and, you know, I think you know that's because I'm a product of West Hartford schools, and my whole family is. My mom and I actually had the same math teacher, 23 years apart, in the same high school. Uh, and and so, who did better? <laughs> yeah. And so you know, I, what I want you guys to know, fellow neighbors, residents, and all of you guys here tonight, is I want to bring something different to the town council. I want to bring smarter spending, and I want to keep the same strong values we have openness, diversity, a welcoming community, excellent schools, great fire and police departments. Those things I think we need to maintain, but we have to take a smarter spending approach to town government. Thank you very much, Ryan. And next we'll have Beth Kerrigan. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters for providing us with this opportunity. Thank you for the candidates we're sharing this table with. Um, and thank you to West Hartford Community Television um, and also the viewers at home that are taking the time to uh, see your, your government and your town at work. 
Um, I am excited to be seeking a second term as your town councilor. For those of you who supported me my first term, last term, um, I hope I have served you well. And for those whose support I did not have, I hope I may have earned your support. Um, as a self-employed businesswoman, married uh, mom with two sons attending the public schools, I am running to protect what we have and what we love. Now more than ever, we must keep our eye on the ball and focus on the future. We can't fall, sh uh, we can't fall to short-term thinking. We need to work together um, to keep West Hartford affordable for all those who call West Hartford home. We must continue to support and attract local businesses who give so much to our town, both in terms of income and also in terms of enriching our culture. We must balance the needs and wants of our diverse community, at the same time being sensitive to living within our budget whether it be the quality of our schools, our public safety, our walkability, we're a nationally recognized town. We all take pride in saying we're from West Hartford. Um, as a nationally recognized schools, safe communities, I just looked at, did you put up a one minute thing? Okay, I'm gonna cut through this real quick. Um, we're fortunate to live in a community where so many give so much to bring us events to enjoy like Center Streets, the Pooch Plunge, Johnny's Jog, the Park Road Parade, and the list goes on and on. Of course, affordability is critical. No one likes when costs go up. And as a mom nearing retirement while saving for college, I feel the squeeze of increasing expenses. But the state is in crisis. We must preserve all that we have already achieved through proper budgeting, consistent credit status, and keeping costs such as education, safety, and infrastructure in line. 10 seconds. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll vote for me, Beth Kerrigan, as well as the entire Democratic team on November 7th. You can always join me on Facebook, uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Beth. My and uh, Chris Burns. Thank you, Carol. Um, thank you. Thanks to the West Hartford Television, to the League of Women Voters, my colleague Ryan, to Dallas, Beth, and Leon for this fulsome discussion that we had this evening. Uh, I always appreciate talking about the issues. Um, this is my fourth campaign in five years. Um, sometimes I wonder why uh, every year I continue to run a campaign and uh, put my family through it, but at the end of the day, I love doing it, uh, and they know I love doing it. I have a passion for it, and so every year, it seems like I'm out campaigning uh, for your vote. Uh, I enjoy the work on the council, and I love serving the people of West Hartford. As you can tell from our discussion tonight, at least for my part, I think the biggest issue, and I, I think my colleagues agree, is finances, state finances, town finances, and trying to find a balance uh, between our spending, uh, our tax increases, our budget, our debt trajectory that we are uh, experiencing right now, and that is going to have a direct impact on the quality of life that we have in town. Those are issues that are not going away. Our budget increases are largely 85 to 90 percent for wages, pension, and health care contributions for current employees and for retirees. Those numbers will continue to go up every single year unless we either get those numbers under control or do something different on the spend side, those are the only things that will change our maintenance budgets year to year and actually provide some tax relief to the people of West Hartford. We need to be concerned about our public schools. They are in jeopardy for the reasons we talked about tonight. Our property values, increasing taxes, school maintenance, road maintenance, those are things that are on people's minds in our town and we need to be wary of that. If you follow the town council, you'll know that I lead on issues, whether it's an international school looking to buy public school seats or the MDC or our town officials or state officials. I'm an outspoken advocate for the people of West Hartford, and I look forward to having your vote on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. And final as Dallas yeah. Dodge. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, and thank you also to West Hartford TV and to the League of Women Voters for hosting us tonight. It's been an honor to serve on the West Hartford Town Council. My favorite part, as I mentioned earlier tonight, is meeting neighbors in town. And over the past few weeks, especially as I've hit the campaign trail, I've had the pleasure of meeting so many families who, like me, moved here for our great schools and our great community. I've met seniors who have seen their children grow and thrive here, largely because of West Hartford's public schools, and business owners who are drawn to our vibrant commercial districts and economic diversity. But as somebody who's raising a young family in town and with parents who do still live in town, I too am concerned about affordability. And we do need to make sure that we continue making sure West Hartford is a place that's a great place to live and a place that people can afford to live. These are challenging times and we can preserve our quality of life while keeping West Hartford affordable. 
I'm proud of how Democrats have risen to meet these challenges, and I hope that I can earn your support for another term on the town council. And if I could just for a moment, I promised my son I'd say this. Hi, Dallas and Felicity. Now go to bed. <laughs> very good. That's a very nice closing, Dallas. And well, we encourage all viewers to make sure you get out to vote on November 7th. And to please share with your friends and neighbors that this particular debate and the others that are being taped by WHCTV will be shown uh, regularly between October 9th and Election Day. So please make sure you take that opportunity and learn about your candidates. And I want to thank Jen Evans of WHCTV, who does a fabulous job every year. She's indispensable mm -hmm. to us. And the candidates for coming and participating in this, and to all our timers who help keep us in line. <laughs> um, so. I say good night and again, don't forget to vote.